Five Country Close Up, 10 I suppose my reaction is probably the same as everybody else's. I don't know. When they tell them they got cancer, why, your dauber's down, you don't know what, you just think, well, this is it. Oftentimes, the courts are not geared to this. The courts are geared to what is right and what is wrong. And mediation is geared to uh, possibly a mistake has happened, but what can we do to resolve the conflict that has arisen and, and what can we do to set up guidelines so it won't happen again, won't occur again. I feel, you know, a little bit superior being able to drive tons of machinery down the road and, and not having uh, anybody tell me how to do it or, or where to go with it. It's just that I'm, I'm there and I'm taking it where it's supposed to be. I'm Bob Pyle. I'm Charlene Peroni. I'm Twyla Young, and this is Five Country Close-Up. Tonight we'll look at a new way for neighbors to solve their legal controversies, and we'll find out what it's like to drive an 18-wheeler. But first, we'll take a look at the emotional impact of cancer on the people who have it and the people around them. Twyla? Charlene, cancer is a word that we don't use very much. We don't like to talk about the disease. It's a disease that's so frightening to us that our fears of it and our image of it often lag behind medical realities. I think cancer is an illness that has been around a long time, but it has not been spoken of or dealt with openly until just the last few years. And in years past, cancer meant death. There was no treatment. And so consequently, when they hear they have cancer, it's very, very frightening. It brings out our ultimate helplessness. Nobody likes to feel helpless either as an individual or as a society. I suppose my reaction is probably the same as everybody else's. I don't know. When they tell them they got cancer, why, your dauber's down, you don't know what, you just think, well, this is it. This is the oncology or cancer clinic of Iowa Lutheran Hospital in Des Moines. It's a place where many of the cancer patients from around Iowa come in order to receive chemotherapy, the massive doses of drugs aimed at killing the cancer cells. Chemotherapy is a frightening idea to many people, mainly because of the widespread belief that it automatically means severe, painful, debilitating side effects. He told me that uh, there was people that wouldn't take this chemotherapy because uh, of the effects of it. Well, it might not affect all people as the same, but uh, it sure doesn't affect me that way. I, uh, we have people down in the chemotherapy room, the waiting room, when I'm down there for treatments, that have lost their hair and they've had uh, uh, several side effects. But uh, I, sure, I sure can say this, that uh, it's sure been worth, worth it to me. I would, uh, I would even think that I would even suffer a little if I had to, to, to take them because uh, there's no alternative. I mean, it's either that or, this, or that's it. Leo Gingery is a retired tool and die maker. A few years back, he had open heart surgery. It was frightening. But it wasn't anything like finding out last spring that he has cancer. Says Gingery, when they tell you that, it knocks the soup out of you. But when they told me I had cancer, it was a different heart. They could fix that, I guess. I understood. They told me they could fix it up. The surgeon told me that. He says, we're going to make a new man out of you. And he did. He did. He actually did. And uh, this deal, when uh, they came in there and told me I had cancer, it was a difference. It's different. There's no cure for cancer, and, and uh, you just know it. Cancer is one word that means a multitude of different diseases, each with its own treatment, each with its own pattern, each with its own chances of survival. But according to cancer specialist Dr. Mayank Katari, half the battle with any cancer is the emotional battle, the adjustment to a new kind of life. Uh, even if the patient has a potentially curable cancer, uh, the immediate thought that comes to the mind is, uh, when am I going to die? Half the battle in the entire natural history uh, may be just fear and emotions. It's a war between emotions and fear that takes away a lot of energy from the patients. 
the cancer patient often has concerns about no longer being productive. And I think what this ignites is um, a fear of lack of worth. One thing that makes us all function well is when we feel that we're worthwhile, we're productive, we're doing things that, uh, through which we can command the respect of others. That's the bad part of this. Uh, I, uh, I want to do something. I'm not sick, but I'll be sitting in a chair and I want to do something and I can't, and that's what makes, that's what hurts. For about two weeks there, I'd sit and set Davenport over there, or a chair, and, and look at the walls and think, and then I'd get in the car and go downtown for a while and come back home, and, and uh, I, ha I really had a, I had a bad view. I really did. I don't know. It's just it's one of them things. And one night he came in there at 10.30 and I asked him. And he said, yes. He says, you got pretty bad. He says, um, he says but it's treatable. And uh, of course I was down. He knew I was down. And he said, now this is treatable. He says, uh, that's the last word he said when he went out of the room. He said, now I want you to remember this is treatable. Sherry Turner is 16 years old. She's a junior in high school. She's a moped buff, and she has leukemia. Well, I was really scared because I didn't know anything about it. And anger that it had to be me, you know, I couldn't, and I was kind of mystified, I guess, because I didn't really understand why it had to be me and why I had it and things like that. And then. I didn't want to go into the hospital, <laughs> not at all. Why not? I don't, I don't know, I've never really been in hospitals that much and I just don't care for needles and <laughs> doctors and all that stuff. A lot of the time it was pretty much anger because I had to go through all that stuff. That was just about it and then I went, you know, it didn't bother me anymore, it just kind of went away. Sherry has had cancer for nearly two years now, and she's living a fairly normal life again. Except for missing sports, in which she can no longer participate, she says she rarely even thinks about her disease. I don't even feel like I have it anymore. It does. Every, just once a month when I have to go in for treatment, that's the only time I really realize I have it. I used to be involved in sports quite a bit, and I can't do that anymore. I just get too tired. How does it make you feel not to be able to do that anymore? Well, sometimes when all my other friends are doing stuff that, you know, I can't do, it makes me kind of mad, but otherwise it doesn't really bother me. I think in, in terms of the families of cancer patients, this is where the uh, focus of education should also be, that the patient should continue, as I indicated before, and continue to be treated as a worthwhile individual and not someone that... Uh, is in essence committing a crime by becoming dependent and becoming ill. You have to have the understanding and uh, the support of your family while you're going through the treatments and I think more so when you're 14 and totally confused about the world as it is anyway so without having to deal with something that serious. You have to know that they understand you and they're, they're going to stick by you no matter how you feel. If you're crabby, tired, ill from the chemotherapy that they're not going to just say, well, we're not going to deal with you anymore. But the fight for survival can have some rewards. Has having leukemia had any kind of positive effect in your life? I, th I think it's made me so I can handle problems a little bit more maturely than I used to be able to. I think that I could take a, a, a rough decision a lot better than I used to could. Somebody said to you, how do you feel about your life right now? What would you say to me? I'm satisfied with it. I could be better you know, if I didn't have to go to school and <laughs> things like that. But that's about as good as it could be, I guess. Charlene, the patients and families that we talked to emphasized how important education and information about their disease is in helping them deal with their fears and their emotions. Certainly, because that lessens the fear of the unknown. Well, that's right. In fact, a lot of people are becoming more informed about many facets of modern society, and that includes the legal system. Very true. These days, when somebody says, I'm taking you to court, he really means it. Everybody wants his legal rights, and that's created quite a backlog in the courts, a backlog that Polk County is trying to relieve through a system of neighborhood justice. Why don't you give us your side of what happened? Well, we were at the party, like John Ann said, and uh, 
this dude I didn't know came up and was hugging her and uh, she was uh, reciprocating and hugging him back and uh, she knows I'm jealous and uh, I hit her. What you're watching is a dramatized version of a neighborhood mediation session. The people involved are only acting. The problem they're discussing, it's common. But the method they're using to solve the problem is new, at least in Polk County. Again, you know about the work we've been doing with battered women and things like that, and you know how I feel about physical abuse. So I got hot for a moment, and you know I'm emotional, and uh, it happened. But nothing was happening there. And you go to the there. county attorney. I don't believe you. But nothing was happening that night. I don't understand why you hid me. The and man in the case has been lately. accused of hitting his girlfriend. Okay. She complained to the Polk County well, attorney, and her I complaint was referred to the Neighborhood Mediation Center. I'm Dan Johnston. In the past, when people living together or living close together had differences or problems, they had three alternatives. They could ignore the problem, handle it themselves, or call the police, file charges, and end up in court. Our Neighborhood Mediation Center is another alternative. And the people who come to the Neighborhood Mediation Center? Basically, they're uh, neighbors, uh, individuals who uh, reside in the same apartment buildings or in the same geographic area. Uh, generally, they're younger people. Uh, they're people who uh, uh, have uh, some reason to want to stop whatever the problem is because of the ongoing contact they're going to have with each other. What sort of problems do you generally see, Joanne? Uh, we see everything from barking dog disputes to uh, visitation rights with children to uh, living situations, uh, assault cases, different things like this. The people who sit as mediators come directly from the community. They're people who care, who want to help. They're sent through rigorous training to learn to listen, to observe, and most important, to learn to remain neutral, because the real success of mediation depends on their ability to see both sides. May I ask, at the party was, uh, shall we say, was Chris under the influence of alcohol? Would that have any bearing on why he hit you? Were you? I don't, you know, that's something I can't answer. I just had a drink. But uh, do you feel that this is your normal behavior or that al alcohol might have influenced your decision? Oh, we usually don't drink when we go out together. So I don't think that's, that plays a role. The session is run informally, and the people are quickly put at ease, often in spite of the friction separating the two. But there are also a few legal touches that formalize the proceedings and keep both parties from taking the whole thing lightly. The notice which they get before mediation looks a little official, and uh, it kind of brings them to terms with the fact that this is something that they should uh, pay attention to. But uh, I have one here which does say that uh, the Polk County Attorney's Office has received a request to file a criminal charge against you as a result of an incident, so on and so forth. Do you think it was right? Do you really think I deserved getting hit? No, I'm sorry I did. And I'm sorry it happened. And I'm sorry we're here, so can we go now? No, I just want to make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay, it won't happen again. Okay? Would but you like to have an agreement that uh, a binding agreement that uh, specifies that this is the way you feel and the way John Ann feels. What's this binding agreement? You know. Generally, there's nothing in the agreement that attributes guilt to either party. It's merely a statement of conditions that both persons agree to live within, conditions that both agree will help them resolve their differences. It's usually not just one problem um, why people have to come to this in the first place. It's usually uh, a multitude of problems and uh, that's what we do best we listen to them and find out about their circumstances and then begin to help them find ways to address it which a court you know a court hearing just doesn't take those kinds of things into account well, the court's still in black and white and as, as you know as Paula was saying you're saying you know we get into the gray areas and in trying to resolve uh, the basic root of the problem before it escalates into uh, a major kind of uh, crime. The current backlog of cases in all courts has forced long delays. After charges are filed, it could take more than a month for that case to be heard. With neighborhood mediation, the waiting time is shortened considerably, generally okay. from 30 to as little oh. as seven days. 
Chris and John Ann, we have written up this mediation agreement, and I'd like to read it to you, and you will agree whether or not it's uh, what you have stated you would like to happen. John Ann and Chris have agreed that they will undergo counseling for a six months period with the appropriate agency which can help them, and that Chris has agreed that there will be no further incidences of hitting and no more aggravation, and he will discontinue the late night phone calls which have upset John Ann. They will both try to communicate more openly about each other's needs and emotion if they continue to have this ongoing relationship. Now, before you sign this, I want you to know that here we have stated in the bottom of the agreement, should the terms and conditions of this agreement be violated by either or both of the above-named parties, it is understood that the Polk County Attorney's Office may prosecute this action in the criminal courts of the state of Iowa. While a handshake doesn't necessarily mean that the situation that brought two people here is resolved, mediators generally agree it's a good start. And that's what the Neighborhood Mediation Center is all about. In spite of the fact that many sessions end just like this, mediators say there are still a few frustrations connected with the job. The one big disappointment as far as being a mediator is we refer them to counseling, and yet we never know, we never see them again, which is nice for the, um, the respondent and the complainant because this is this neutral person that they're just seeing one time. But as a mediator, you sometimes wonder what's happening with that case. and. That's the only thing. It's You're sort of like a traffic cop directing them to appropriate agencies to solve the other problems. Mediators seem to agree that the real satisfaction comes in watching the system of mediation itself, a system that personalizes justice, that forces people to sit down and settle their differences. Where, where we have people, we're going to always have people problems, and, and oftentimes the courts are not the appropriate uh, spot. And so this is just one alternative to try and help people deal with some of their problems. In foreign countries, they use it, I believe, in, the, uh, in China that before you can uh, make an appeal to go to court, first you must go through mediation. It's working well in uh, Arabic and uh, Scandinavian countries. And uh, we're seeing it uh, developed here in the United States in uh, Kansas City, Philadelphia, uh, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Des Moines. Charlene, how successful has the program been in Polk County? Well, Bob, according to the project coordinator, uh, more than 90% of the cases heard are resolved, at least on a temporary basis, and that's not a bad track record for a program that's only a year and a half old. Up next, a look at the life of a long-distance truck driver and an experiment in driving one of those mammoth rigs. Ever wonder what it's like to make your living on the open road? Well, recently I spent some time with some folks who know firsthand and found out that truck driving isn't all that it's cracked up to be. Oh, 
This is the way many people picture today's trucker. They see him as rough. And tough. And defined of the law. Movies, television, and radio have been doing it for years, pushing an image of the American trucker that, for the most part, doesn't exist. Everybody thinks the truck driver is big and bad and everything, which they're not. They're only human. John Chapman has been driving a truck for the past four years. In that time, he's never considered his job as glamorous. Instead, he sees himself as an average Joe doing an important job. When you turn around and... Uh... No, look at him. He's like you or average mechanic down the shop, factory worker or something. He's just trying, trying to make a living the best way he knows how. John doesn't drive alone. He's part of a team. His partner is Kay Dudley. She's been driving with John for the past year and loving every minute of it. it it's great. I wouldn't trade it now for anything, but I, uh, you know, it's not like being a housewife. That's, that's for sure. You, you get a lot of, you, you see a lot of people, you, you see a lot of places, but it's very tiresome. You don't have time to rest. You don't have time to, to uh, sleep as much as you like or, or uh, eat what you want or you eat where, where you can and, and grab a bite here and there, have coffee when you, when you get a chance to stop. Jamming gears cross country isn't easy. The hours are long and many times lonely. That's one of the big reasons many trucking firms welcome teams, be it two males, husband and wife, or boyfriend, girlfriend. Teams provide companionship. Yeah, you get the companionship of having somebody to talk to when you want to talk, but we go for hours without talking. Believe it or not, we can sit there and still be alone. Well, it's a lot better than being out there running by yourself. John learned his trade in Vietnam, driving a mail truck. There was no formal training for him. The Army just put him behind a wheel, and he learned by doing. Kay's story's a little different. She's a graduate of the Iowa Truck Driving School. There she gained a certain confidence she never had before. I don't know, maybe it's a feeling of um, something that, that uh, not, not very many women can do. I feel, you know, a little bit superior being able to drive tons of machinery down the road and, and not having... Uh, anybody tell me how to do it or, or where to go with it. It's just that I'm, I'm there and I'm taking it where it's supposed to be. The school, located in West Des Moines, has been turning out skilled drivers for the past two and a half years. Each student pays a $545 fee. In return, they get two weeks of rules and regulations. Today we're going to go over the federal DOT regulations, Department of Transportation regulations, and practice backing up. Most important, on-the-road experience. Actually, we just teach the basics, and there's so much you learn every day. You learn something new out there on the road, you know, how to cope with situations or how to watch for trouble or uh, be able to pick up something before it happens, you know. And the on-the-road driving is your best experience, but then some people just don't have that opportunity to do that. Betty Carnes is a school's director. She speaks with a voice of experience. As well as being an instructor at the school, she's also a seasoned driver who loves the open road. It's not dull. It's a new experience, a, a new place every time. The money's pretty good. You're meeting people all the time, different people, seeing the country. And it kind of gives you a sense of power sitting up where you can see everything. As both an instructor and driver, Betty says she's developed a pretty good eye for talent behind the wheel. One such talented person, according to Betty, is Marta Parrott of Creston. Yeah, there's more of a challenge out there because you're always doing different things. You're always going different places. Marta thought since both her father and brother are truck drivers, it would be a cinch for her to carry on the family tradition and be a truck driver too. But she forgot to take one thing into consideration, her sex. She's a woman trying to break into what many consider to be a man's profession. A lot of people like 
your cars and things, I'll really look down on ladies for being a truck driver because they think they should be at home working and taking care of the kid. But that isn't going to slow down Marta. As a matter of fact, it might just spur her on. Oh, you figure a lot of men that are truck drivers, a lot of them don't really care. They're just out there for the money. But, you know, when a lady truck driver does it, she's out there for the money, too, but she's out there for the respect of the men. While there are many success stories to come out of the Iowa truck driving school, there are also a few that are not so successful. Take me, for example. But instead of passing judgment on myself, let me show you how my first driving session went and let you decide whether I have a future as a trucker. Okay, hey, Betty, when you're, uh, correct me if I'm wrong now, first gear is over one and then straight back, right? Start turning it hard. Hard, hard, hard. Stay over to the left. Now, where's my brake on this thing? Is it the middle thing? Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but you should be looking in this mirror here because you can't huh. see the end of your trailer in that mirror. My, my mirror over there. Yeah. I don't. All I see is this big white thing. That's, That's the trailer, right? <laughs> Well, I consider myself a pretty good driver, but uh, driving that truck was not easy. Well, it doesn't look particularly easy from inside the cab, although it does look like fun. I thought, you know. It was. It was oh, really good. Was. That's Five Country Close Up for this evening. Join us again in two weeks. We'll be back here on October 16th. I'm Charlene Peroni. And I'm Bob Pyle. I'm Twyla Young. Good night. Mm -hmm.